expectancy in this country is for white women in Minnesota, who can expect to live to 83. Lowest life expectancy is for black men in Arkansas. There is a 15-year difference in life expectancy. By the way, this is the same difference in life expectancy between Nicaragua and Switzerland. Nicaragua and Switzerland in the same country. Here is a map of life expectancy at birth by state. This is 2010, um, uh, and uh, what you actually see here is roughly the same thing I told you here, which is about a five to 10 year difference in life expectancy by state. Now, one of the challenges we have being in uh, Massachusetts is that we all know that we're in the sort of a, in the most liberal progressive state in the union. We're essentially in Canada. Um, uh, and uh, there's a map of Boston by chief of the city of Boston, which is not because we don't have hospitals. We have a lot of hospitals. We are, these places are surrounded by world-class medical facilities. They're all equidistant for world-class medical facilities. No, the reason for fivefold, fivefold, which is enormous, fivefold difference in the presence of diabetes in Boston within two miles is simply because of different patterns of social structures that ultimately determine health. So, what are these structures? And uh, let me just go through a few of them. I'm actually going to do this is a bit of a highlight reel, and I think the factors that are uh, most important. I will start with race. There is no question that health in this country is a clear manifestation of social structures, deep systematic racial divides manifesting, sort of term that's used as under the skin, becomes physiology. And let me just show you some, some obvious data. This is US life expectancy by race over the past, this is 1970 to 2010. Um, you see national overall is blue, um, white is red, black is, I don't know, this is the orange color, right? There's been a systematic four, five year, five year gap in life expectancy between black and white in this country overall. Whenever you see this, sometimes you sort of forget how pervasive that is. And that pervades everything that we do. Here's sort of a, a simple slide like that. This is the likelihood of cancer patients being alive after five years of that from diagnosis. So this is simply, this is saying you've been diagnosed with cancer. What's your likelihood of being alive five years later? So you see two things. Number one is, you see how it's going up, right? That's good. Our treatment for cancer is getting better. Everybody's, everybody's being alive more. But look, 1980 to 2005, that you, you have a, had a consistent 10 to 12% differential likelihood of survival five years after cancer diagnosis by race in this country. And I could show you, I mean, we have to spend a whole hour showing you data like this. The bottom line is there are deep racial health divides in this country, and those deep racial health divides are a clear manifestation of deep social racial divides. This is a um, fairly popular cover of Time magazine um, capturing some of the tensions last year, mostly that were triggered by shooting of an ar unarmed young black man. But the shooting of an unarmed young black man reflect, again, deeper social structural divides, a lot of them manifesting in forces like segregation. So this is um, um, Kansas City metropolitan area. What you have here is uh, the red are um, zip codes where they are predominantly white. The blue are zip codes that are predominantly black. And the white are where there is actually mixing. So this is a classic picture of deep segregation, where the races are not coming together. There's another picture. This is Milwaukee, which actually was, was last year the most deep racially segregated city in, uh, in America. And perhaps to make the point most clearly, this is uh, from a study that's done at the University of Michigan looking at the census where everybody is, becomes a point on a map and uh, looking, honing in on Detroit. So I'm going to show you Detroit. And this is Detroit where you see a, um, it's a classic, this is eight miles of the road. I spent five years in University of Michigan um, and did a lot of studies in Detroit. And that's eight miles, that's the road, eight miles, and you have white and black clearly as a clear picture of like the other side of the road. That is the picture of social division that we have created in this country that is manifesting as health division. That's race. So about income and poverty. I'm going to show you something about income, fully recognizing that the link between income, poverty, and race is tightly intertwined. It's essentially impossible to, to extricate and separate apart. But let's talk about income. There are, again, I could spend an hour showing you graphs that show you the, how clear the link is between income and health achievement. Here's just one, one slide. This is stroke. Stroke death among people over age 45. So what you see here is income, lower income on the left, higher income on the right. And you see, the more money you have, the less likely it is that you are going to have a stroke over age 45. How does income drive health? 
in, in uh, let me count the ways. This is actually, I really like, I like this graph. This is um, so how it can drives help. And you look on the left, and uh, the, the way to read this is um, the, um, the top bar are people who are um, uh, below the federal poverty limit, and the bottom, as you get down the, down the bars, you're getting richer, okay? So on the left, you have workers with paid sick and vacation leave, or pension and retirement contributions. The more money you make, the more likely you are to have paid sick leave, the more likely you are to have um, retirement contributions. The next bar, neighborhoods have sidewalks, parks, or playgrounds. The richer you are, the more likely you are to have neighborhoods with sidewalks, plus, plus, uh, parks, or playgrounds. Next one, individuals who report their next and very good health. The richer you are, the more likely you are to report your next and very good health. Right? So essentially, this graph could be columns all stretching across the screen. The more money you have, the more likely you are to be in a positive, live in a positive environment that protects your health. Now, we are not doing so well on fixing this. This is um, going from 1989 to 2013, and what this is is wealth. This is family wealth. Whenever we talk about income, and when you read epidemiologic data on income, you're almost always reading about income. Income meaning your paycheck. But what is hidden behind that is wealth. And wealth is ultimately what is transmitted from generation to generation and what ultimately deepens social demands. So what you see here is the holdings of family wealth by wealth group over time. And there are three bars here. The light blue bar is the top 10%. The next bar is the 51st to 90th percentile. And the, you see the invisible bar at the bottom is the bottom 50%. So the bottom 50% in this country essentially has no wealth. Which means, of course, I'm going to get to this later, that there is a structural impediment to advancing intergenerational advancement across income and class groups. And it really belies the national law of Henry Min. It belies the notion of pulling yourself up by, by bootstraps, when in fact, you have much, much tougher and better bootstraps if you're in the top 10%, like an enormous amount. Um, uh, and these divides on income have been in, there for decades and decades. If you just look at the, so you have all races, which is the sort of teal line in the middle. White is the red bar. Um, you have Latino, and you have black in the bottom. So everybody's income is going up, but everybody's income continues these big divides. And this is poverty rate by state, which, by the way, when you look at the map, it's no coincidence that it matches directly on the health map by states that show the Now, the reason I pointed out the bottom 50% is because I think one of the mistakes we make when we talk about income and poverty is we tend to think of, well, them poor people. And uh, there is a notion of poverty being something that affects a small proportion of people. But um, one of the most helpful frames I find around poverty is to say poverty is actually multidimensional and broadly speaking, it is affecting the bottom 50% of America. Bottom 50% means, you know, the, the, the language is fairly low, but bottom 50% means one in two. That is half of Americans. So the Brookings Institution had this report, which I quite like, called the five evils of poverty. And what they said is what percent of Americans have low income, lack of education, no health insurance, live in a poor area, or have joblessness. The bottom line is each of those are about in the 10 to 20 percent range. But the operative question is, what percent of Americans have one of those? Which means they either have low income, low, lack of education, no health insurance, live in a third area, or joblessness. And the answer is, about half of Americans live with that disadvantage. Which, again, maps onto the picture I showed you earlier, that there is a, the bottom 50 percent of Americans have absolutely no wealth. And when you look at this, of course, this maps on directly to race. And the way to read this is white is the dark blue bar. Latino and black are the other light bars and showing that Latino and black are much higher on all of these. And this, again, gets perpetuated over and over and over again. And what this looks at is the bachelor's degree attainment by age 24. So over time, what percent of people are getting bachelor's degree by uh, over the, this is 20 years? And all you're looking at here, the blue bar on top is the top quartile of income, and below it you have the lower quartiles of income. The, essentially, the bottom line is this. The only social group that has, in any significant proportion, likelihood of obtaining a bachelor's degree, which is a majority, like 70 in the 70s, is the richest quartile. Notice how this maps on again with what I showed you earlier. The top 20% is increasing life expectancy. 
top 20% is the only group with life expectancy, top 25% is the only group that's obtaining bachelor's degrees in any measure, the bottom 50% essentially has no resources. That is the kind of country that's the picture of social divide that characterizes this country. And this is, um, just to bring it back to health for a second, this is spending on, is it middle class families spending on healthcare in this country versus other spending. Between 27 and 2014, middle class families spend 25% more on healthcare and they're spending less in the past 50 years on clothing, food away from home, total food, transportation, housing, and food at home. And because of course we have created a world where these social conditions, social divides, put pressure and result in health wise. So I talked about race, talked about income, let's talk about physical and social conditions. So, physical and social conditions of all stripes ultimately shape health. They're all socially structured. They all are a result of intentional, deliberate policy decisions. Let me show you one of my favorite ones. This is uh, fairly innocuous. I like this one because I feel like it's not completely nonpartisan. So, this is percent of trips made by walking or biking in the US versus Germany and by age groups. So, look at Germany on the right, and you see the older you get, the more likely you are to use a uh, bike, which is the black bar, or to walk for trips, right? When you get to over 75, you have a majority of trips you take are walking or biking. Now look on the left, look at the US. Essentially, we never walk, we never bike. And, um, <laughs> you know, in the, in the classic sense, you know, a lot of my good friends are German, and they're not that different than us. This is not about, this is not about national identity, this is, not, this, is, this is about where we've created a society where walking and biking is disadvantaged because we don't have opportunities to walk, we don't have environments which are safe to walk, we don't have opportunities to bike. This has clear ways in which it maps on to our health devices. This is a map of New York City. This is obesity rates in New York City. The darker the color, the more the obesity. That maps on directly with less walkable neighborhoods. So this is a map of neighborhood walkability. Less walkable neighborhoods, more, more likely are to have obesity. And, of course, less walkable neighborhoods also tend to have much worse food conditions available. This is actually a map of Boston, um, looking at food deserts in Boston. Again, I keep coming back to Boston because I feel like sometimes in Massachusetts we have a sense that um, we are actually sort of better than everybody else, when in fact we're not. Here's from a study we had done in Detroit. These are a lot of houses in Detroit. You can actually take houses like this, you can map onto maps of Detroit um, uh, the building conditions. Oops. So this is a map of Detroit. The darker the color, the where you have worse building conditions. You can look at things like graffiti. You can also create maps where you show the darker the color, you can show more graffiti. And you know, we've done analyses that show this. This is, a, this is depression in a neighborhood with less graffiti. That is depression in a neighborhood with more graffiti. And I'll show you other, many other studies that show that the physical environment has real implications, not just for physical health, but also for, for, uh, for mental health. And Again, to come back to the conflation of the issues of race, income, wealth, um, uh, poverty, these are race gaps in high poverty neighborhoods. So black is the top line, Latino, then uh, white. And what you see is, over time, we are actually going up in terms of number of people living in high poverty neighborhoods. Black is supposed to do worse than Latino, even though it's do worse than white. And uh, same as joblessness. Same as joblessness, this is joblessness, that's black, Latino, and white. Again, black consistently higher than white. Um, uh, and uh, other forces, actually, I have only one slide on this. I think it's a really important issue, but I don't have time to talk about all issues. Um, this is um, incarceration. This is actually the map of incarceration um, uh, in this country. The darker the color, the color is where we incarcerate people more. And um, again, this maps onto the this maps onto the map of the country in terms of where you have the social divides and where you have the health divides. So. One of the challenges with this kind of line of reasoning is, okay, well, you're just observing all these things. Can we do something about them? If we did something about them, would it matter? The answer is absolutely. If we did something about these things, it would matter. And, and there is an abundance of emerging literature, and actually well-established literature, that shows that you can act on social factors and you can improve the health of populations. Here's a, just a few sn snapshots. This is um, from uh, one study. This is from the um, um, effects of exposure to better neighbors in children from the MTO, the Movement to Opportunity Study, showing clearly these are um, um, uh, people who are in public housing who are given opportunities to move from public housing to better neighborhoods. Those who move to better neighborhoods ended up having more income. Here's from another study that shows that math score for students uh, in public housing for students who are sent to better schools end up doing better, end up having better, better math scores. Here is from a study 
that shows that actually if you improve school quality, you're going to reduce obesity. Now, how about environment? I often hear, well, yes, you talk about things like that, but you can't improve the environment because we live in a, in a terrible physical environment, nothing we can do about it. It's not true. There's an example of Naples, Florida. You can say, take a place like that, which looks terrible because you never walk, you never bike. And you can add trees in the center median. You can add slow speed lanes. You can add street trees and parked cars. You can add shop fronts and sidewalks. And all of this results in the transformation of a neighborhood to a more walkable neighborhood. Does this make a difference? Here's from a study that was done by um, CDC a couple of years ago. They looked at heart disease, cancer, respiratory disease, stroke, and unintentional injuries. And what you have here is the blue bar are the actual deaths we observe around the country. The light blue bar are number of deaths we could prevent. And now here's the nice thing about this. It was actually a very simple question that said, let's not imagine doing something outlandish. Let us simply take the top three states on each of these measures. So if we apply that measure to all the other states, what would happen in the country? And what would happen is this. We would actually save 90,000 premature heart disease deaths, 85,000 cancer deaths, 30,000 chronic low respiratory disease deaths, 17,000 stroke deaths, and 37 unintentional injury deaths. That is simply by applying best practices from the top three states on each of these five indicators. So we know what to do. We know what can be done. This is from another study that actually looks at, uh, that looks at deaths we could avert by pouring more and more money into medical advances. That's the, that's the uh, black bar. And deaths we could avert by pouring more and more money into better education. That's the white bar. Bottom line is, medical advances we can probably uh, avert another 178,000 deaths. Correcting disparities in education, we could avert about a million deaths, which is a ratio of about 8 to 1. So, wither public health. Where is public health in all this? This is the Mass Public Health Association. Uh, I, I am a real believer in the vision, purpose, and uh, scope of public health. And I actually think that public health is ultimately about creating a world where we narrow social divides so that we can narrow health divides. So what should we do? What is public health? Public health is what we, as a society, do collectively to assure the social, economic, cultural conditions for people to be healthy. That means, as far as I'm concerned, that public health cannot, cannot, stay away from the movements that ultimately determine social, economic, and cultural conditions. And those movements are frequently political, and the political is very much smack dab in the middle of the remit of public health. Public health ultimately has to be about not just about physiology, not just about individual behaviors, but about social relations, living conditions, neighborhoods, communities, institutions, and social economic policies. And at the end of the day, it is critical for public health to recognize that the more upstream you go, the more these forces matter. Let me give you one illustration of this. <clears throat> this is uh, from taking the best longitudinal studies that are available out there. You can all look at this. Anybody wants to slide, you can the slides. All the citations are below me. This is on the y-axis. You have a um, hazard ratio. If it's one, <clears throat> it means that something makes no difference. I'll start with no animal mammogram. No animal mammogram actually makes no difference from point of view of overall <clears throat> population overall death. <clears throat> High total cholesterol. A little bit more than one, just a smidge more than one. High systolic blood pressure, it's about the 1.4. Obesity, talked a lot about obesity, it's about 1.5. Smoking, we're now in the 2.3 range. And poverty, we're in about the 2.7. So, we have argued, and this is from a paper that uh, I published with my colleague George Annas at the School of Public Health, that this is, should be the aspirations for public health. Number one, take a leadership role in confronting and influencing social, political, economic factors that determine population health. That's number one. And that means, that means that public health cannot stay silent when you have a political transition that is moving towards creating social, political, and economic conditions that are going to deepen social divides, that are going to further health divides. And number two, and number two is to take a leadership role in reducing inequities by working to narrow health gaps across groups in a ways that promote social justice and I believe firmly that those are the core priorities for public health. Those should be the aspirations of public health. I won't actually get into strategies here just because I want to stick to my hands. So let me talk about the future. Let me talk a little bit about the future. And I, I sort of ended on the future on purpose because I wanted to set the stage for questions um, which inevitably I think are, are linked to our current circumstance. So let me start, let me start with Grimm. Um, uh, so, 
yeah, no. Um, um, yeah, the future doesn't look too good. It's, uh, it's, uh, so uh, this, is, um, this is high poverty census tracts in the Detroit metropolitan area in 2000. This is Detroit. I've worked census tracts in Detroit in 2000. This is high poverty census tracts in Detroit in 2013. This is nationally. High poverty census tracts nationally by area type. This is, uh, you see we had a dip in 2000 has been going on ever since. Most of the high poverty census tracts are in metropolitan areas. With more and more people living in poverty, essentially we've gone from 2000 to about 2000 census tracts in extreme poverty to about 4000 census tracts in extreme poverty. Um, um, what about the American dream? What about the American dream of the fact that's okay, poverty is okay because the kids are born and they, they make it happen because they're brilliant. It's the American dream it's sort of hogwash. It's not true, actually. People in this country stay in the social group in which they are born. Kids born within different age groups, these are the neighborhoods they grew up in, which you see the black and white kids. And you see 33% of kids born in medium poverty, 30% in high poverty. And uh, that was uh, 30 years ago. It's roughly exactly the same today. And when you look at data about uh, uh, class jumping, there is essentially no class jumping in this country. It, just, it does not exist. Um, our numbers of people in poverty, Roughly increased or roughly stayed the same. So, to sum up, so what causes health? What causes health? Obviously, health is multifactorial, it's complex, we all understand it, we're all sophisticated enough to understand it, but here's a very simplistic look at what causes health. Health behaviors cause health, social physical environments cause health, genetics matter, healthcare matters, and a whole bunch of other stuff matter. But the bottom line is that most of what creates healthier populations, most of what creates populations, that ultimately are healthy until we die, are behavior, social, physical environments. Okay? So taking that, that, that pie chart and making it into a bar, this is from the Boston Foundation, it's the same thing, now I put that in a bar, just because I want to show you how that maps onto what we spend our money on. We spend our money, 90% of our money, on medical services, which roughly is due, causes maybe 5 to 10% of health. We have an enormous mismatch. We're spending all our money, all our money, in actually making us healthy once we get sick, and we're spending no money in keeping ourselves healthy. Now, again, yes, but this is the Massachusetts Public Health Association, so we have it all figured out Massachusetts, right? No. This has changed in Massachusetts state spending over the past 15 years. We have increased our spending on healthcare by 81% over the past 15 years, and we have decreased or kept the same our spending on private sector education, law and public safety, mental health, public health, higher education, early childhood education, environmental recreation, essentially everything that matters. This is Massachusetts. So let me go back to the beginning. Remember at the beginning, I showed you that, um, I showed you data that showed how much more we spend on health than all other countries. So the rub is as follows. We spend a lot, but what we're spending on is medical care, curative care. And in fact, when you combine our spending on curative care with our spending on building a social, physical, cultural environment that narrows health divides, we actually don't spend that much at all. Here's a simple graph on that. This is, um, looks at, again, other high-income countries, France, Sweden, Switzerland, etc. The US is the bar in the middle. And you see the dark blue bar is our spending on medical care. Uh, I apologize, I apologize. The light blue bar is spending on medical care. Got that mixed up in my head. The dark blue bar is what in this paper they call social care. By social care, they mean everything else, everything else that matters. So what, what you see is we spend much more on curative care, much less on everything else. So let me end. I'm going to end with a story and with a metaphor. So here is a story. And I want to end. You know, I started off with the triumph of public health, and I've been taught that uh, if you want people to listen to you or to invite you back, you've got to end on an uplifting note. Um, <laughs> and I realize this talk is a bit of a bummer. So I'm going to end on an uplifting note just so you can like me. Um, um, so one of the biggest triumphs of public health in the past century is our extraordinary success in reducing deaths from car accidents. So let me show you this. The blue bar is number of deaths from motor vehicle accidents over the past 100 years. The blue line. See how it's plummeted? Now here's the cool thing about that. That's plummeted at the same time as the number of vehicle miles driven has gone up extraordinarily. Now we can argue whether it's a good thing or not. I'm just pointing out the facts. Okay? Our mortality from motor vehicles has gone down 15-fold, as the number of vehicle miles driven has gone up 15-fold, which means we have effectively resulted in a 225-fold reduction in mortality per vehicle miles driven, which is extraordinary. Now, have we done that by creating better drivers? 
Have you driven in Boston recently? <laughs> <laughs> no. We haven't done that. We haven't done that by pointing fingers at the driver. We haven't done that by telling drivers, you know, thou shalt do this and that. No, we've done it by creating airbags, seatbelts, better roads, front riding innovation. That is what has made the difference. So I'll end with this. This is my pet goldfish. <laughs> I love my pet goldfish. So I would like my pet goldfish to be healthy. Right? So I can say to my pet goldfish, I want you to swim 10 times clockwise, 10 times counterclockwise in your bowl every day so you get exercise. I could tell my pet goldfish, when I give you the flaky stuff on top of your bowl, don't eat too much so you don't get fat. And I could tell my pet goldfish, you know, if you have a goldfish companion, make sure you have safe goldfish sex. Right? <laughs> I know you're all laughing, but that's what we do all the time. That's what we tell people all the time. But you all know that unless I change my goldfish's water, there is no way my goldfish is going to be healthy. Because ultimately, that is what shapes everything about it. The goldfish's water is the social environment, the physical environment, or economic environment, or political environment. Right now, we're at a place where I worry that our water is threatened, and it is the responsibility of all of us in public health to make sure that's not the case. I will stop there. Thank you so much for inviting me. There are two mics. Ah, there they are. Okay. Sorry, I, I, can, I can see problem from here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what types of policies do you believe putting in place that will help create the disparity between um, putting less money towards care to care, which only people who have more money yeah. can afford, and more towards policies and education for people who have less access. Yeah, I think there is a full range of policies. If anybody's interested, I actually have, a, have an article coming out in STAT, which is the Boston Globe's health section today at 11 o'clock, outlining 10 policy recommendations for the Trump administration, fully expecting they will all be ignored. <laughs> but I thought I had to say it. But, uh, you, can start, you can start from having progressive taxation policies to actually stop reinforcing that wealth accumulated wealth gap I showed you. You can start by investing in early childhood education. You can start by creating early, uh, earned income tax credits for families with children. You can start by creating affordable housing. All of these, and there's a full range of these. You can, you can talk about taxation on harmful products and then reinvesting that money into education. All of this, there's good evidence for it. All of it will make an enormous difference. Thank you. Good morning, Magnolia with Dana Farber Cancer Institute. And you just answered my question. What would be your recommendation for this new administration? But I have another one. Who would you recommend to them to head HHS slash many of the agencies that we all work with and depend on? Wow. <laughs> well, um, I think um, I think Dr. Kamara Jones would be terrific at HHS. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I worry tremendously about what, uh, what is going to happen with these positions, given how important these uh, secretaries are going to be. Um, I, uh, I also worry, just to, I'm not really answering your question fully, except I actually think that Richard would be terrific for that, but um, um, I, I, I actually think that under the new administration, there will be investment in, uh, in health, but I don't think there will be investment in health. I think we're going to see more and more investment in uh, high-tech, high-end medicine, it is going to further deepen the data I showed you here. That's what I worry is going to happen. I'm Roxanne Reddington Wild from ABCD, where the anti poverty agency. Noah Berger of the Mass Budget and Policy, um, whatever the last bit is, association or something, um, produced an analysis and a chart showing poverty going down and tending to zero with the war on poverty in the 60s with Johnson and the US government's policies putting in place Head Start, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs. It was tending, the line was coming straight down to zero when the federal government actually then started disinvesting even before Reagan when it really started going bad. Um, it's one of the, it's the chart that's made me angriest when I've seen graphs to know that we could have done it and we didn't. And I'd love more of your comments on social services and the responsibility of government and all of us taxpayers to support broad 
help for everybody. Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right about the, about the transition that um, started in the 70s. I was sort of leaking it. I was, I was benchmarking it to the 80s, actually for a more pragmatic reason, which is our data is much better starting then, but you're absolutely right about what you said. But let me talk a little bit about the, about the responsibility. You know, one of the things that's most heartbreaking about the current turn of um, political affairs is that uh, in no small part, the um, election of the president-elect is a protest vote. It is a, it is, it is a vote out of a deep sense of disenfranchisement, which we also saw in the Democratic primaries. There was a very, very strong sense of disenfranchisement. And a lot of this disenfranchisement comes from from populations who are really held have nots, who are held left behinds. And uh, so what is heartbreaking is that it is a it is a very reasonable protest vote against a situation that marginalizes and excludes particular groups. But unfortunately, the net effect, unless something dramatic ha dramatic happens and the administration behaves in a totally unexpected way, is going to deepen that. It's going to deepen that marginalization, and it's going to deepen social divides on multiple axes that will deepen the health divide. And you don't use the word responsibility. I think there's an enormous responsibility that uh, government has to ultimately better the lives of the people. And what else does government stand exist for? Government's first responsibility is the safety and security of its people, and second responsibility is to make sure that it creates the conditions for a better life. And the conditions for a better life on um, access of health are very clear and inarguable. Hi, <clears throat> Suzanne Cashman, UMass Medical School. And I ask this question um, with a, a, a confession. I am not a social media person. Uh, but my understanding is that social media plays a, a very strong role in politics. We are, the discussions, we're all in our own echo chambers. How do we break into the echo chambers that are speaking untruths and try to lay bare the situation that Roxanne just um, identified where we have people voting against their self-interest. Yeah, this is, um, this, is, this is an enormous question. For people who haven't read, read um, Frank's classic book about 10 years ago, Was the Trouble with Kansas? I think uh, he really gets, uh, really grapples with this question. And uh, you mentioned social media. I think it's just social media, I think it's the entire national conversation that is enormously polarized, where uh, to go with the old aphorism, you know, you're entitled to your uh, opinions but not to your facts, but in fact we're in a situation where, uh, where very polarized groups uh, have their own facts, and uh, obviously they, not, not all those facts are correct, because there's only one set of facts that happens to be correct. Um, I do think that, if nothing else, this election and should be a, uh, a real awakening about the need for efforts to bridge the conversational divide in this country that has resulted in the conditions that has elected this president. We should not forget that you know, had 40,000 votes in Detroit and 20,000 votes in Milwaukee gone the other way, you'd have had a President Clinton. So really, the margin of votes that actually tipped the balance was very, very little. The social divides would have still been there with President Clinton versus President Trump. So if we are paying attention to them now because of this jarring new reality, well, then it's, it's, a, it's an important lesson. If we can actually address them now, it'll be good for the world 20, 30 years from now. Thank you. One more question. Hi. Lisa Montori Trimble. Uh, I just had a question on how do you think climate change will impact the social divide that you're talking about and the possibility, potential for equity and social justice? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think. Uh, I think it's going to be terrible on climate change, actually. I, uh, I think uh, if, you, if you take the administration's word right now, they're going to undo years of progress on climate change. The evidence is very clear that uh, the uh, adverse consequences of climate change are not borne by the rich, they're actually borne by the poor. Look at things like Hurricane Sandy, which was, we were seeing many, many more extreme weather events driven largely by climate change. Did Hurricane Sandy hit New York? It didn't hit. It didn't hit rich New Yorkers. Hurricane Sandy hit mostly the Rockaways, which are areas that are low-lying, have not been tended to, they're inhabited by people of uh, um, poorer and fewer means. And that is what's going to happen. It's going to happen around the world. I think many of uh, many poorer countries around the world are rightly incensed about uh, what's emerged from the new administration around climate change. And we're going to see the same thing in this country. So I, I think it's uh, it is not only not going to help, that's one of the things that may have the worst long-lasting in terms of uh, regressive policies. Thank you very much for having me.